Hello and welcome to Anatomy of Us, a show dedicated to bringing real help to real couples. I'm your host, Melanie Studley. What's up, guys? My name is Seth Studley. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and together we are high-performance marriage coaches. We are cutting through the bullcrap and creating a movement of happy, healthy, badass couples all over the world. Let's go! What's up, guys? Uh, welcome to the show. Seth and Melanie here. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Melanie is a high-performance marriage coach, and together we have the Anatomy of Us podcast. If this is your first intro to us, we have about 500 episodes, and we've been doing this for about six years. We have people on the show. It's me and Melanie talking about our life and marriage and clinical stuff. And uh, today, we have a cool guy named Mark Scott who wrote a book that we're going to talk about. So, you have a little intro there, Mel. Why don't you well, bring it on home? I wanted to make this as real as real can be because this is real. Mark reached out as like a listener of our show because we did our Anatomy of Redemption series and it was all about like our journey with church and church hurt and all of that. And it was just really, really cool when listeners reach out and they're like, hey, I have this thing that might be helpful to you. And so he shared his book with us and specifically the chapter about like how to talk to your children about Jesus and faith if you're walking through stuff like this. So it was just really, really cool that you reached out and that I just wanted to have you on the show and talk about your book and all of that jazz. But why don't you tell our listeners more about who you are? All right. Um, I'm really excited about this, by the way. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, I think my introduction is, I'll give you the simple part about my wife and children and all of that. But the the core identity of who I am really is the follower of Jesus part. And um, that's going to come into play, obviously, with our conversation today. But I'm just obsessed with the grace of God and um, being a recipient of, of his grace. I am um, a husband to my wife, Nanette. We are going to have our 25th anniversary this summer. Nice. So uh, excited about that. She's put up with me for a long time. Um, we have two daughters. Our uh, youngest daughter is 16. She's a sophomore in high school. She's in the band. Uh, she's really intense into all of that stuff. My older daughter, Presley, turns 21 next week. Oh, my god! So goodness. that's um, kind of crazy to, to think about. Yeah. Um, so I'm a husband and a dad, uh, first and foremost, and an author of this book that we're talking about called You Don't Have to Do That. Um, and I include that up front near the top because it was, it's a it's a big part of my story in my life and an accomplishment to um, to get there. And it, you know, takes some courage to, to put some something like that out there with those kind of thoughts and stuff. Yeah, um, I'm hoping to move more into like a content creator mode of life um, and, and get those things going. Um, but right now I am a full time educator in the public school system here in Texas. I work at an alternative high school, which means we work with students who um, are at risk of not graduating from their regular schools or what we call comprehensive high schools. And so uh, we work with a lot of teenagers that are at risk for lots of different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I was an elementary school principal and I've worked at middle schools and I've been an administrator and a math teacher and an interventionist in all different ways. Worked with youth in one way or another for most of my life um, in the juvenile justice system, mentoring, uh, and of course, a big part of, of what ties in with the book that, and the things we're going to talk about is a lot of youth ministry and children's ministry, uh, especially youth ministry. So I was mostly a youth minister in terms of my pastoral role that I played in the church. Um, but we we kind of, as you can do in a church, you can make up different titles and different jobs as you want. And so I had an associate pastor's role and executive pastor role, but most of my life has been working with uh, teenagers and, and, and youth. Mm -hmm. Amazing. There's, I've been in multiple, multiple alternative schools, like doing mental health therapy with mostly teen boys and running teens groups and stuff like that. So you and I, I, I would have interfaced with you, like in your, in your position, very, very often when I was in the heart of, of doing school-based uh, mm -hmm. mental health therapy oh, cool. and groups cool. and stuff like that. So that's... That, I, yeah, and that was one of the things that really drew me to your book was that you're an educator now you're in and I, I just love it. And I didn't even know the um, alternative high school part of it. I think that's even, I don't want to say cooler cause that sounds weird, but you mm -hmm. have real world experience. It's not just isolated to the church. And I think mm -hmm. that that's super, super important. Um, I don't know. Were you going to say something? Yeah. So you, you came, you reached out after you listened to the anatomy of redemption series 
that we did, if listeners are listening now, if you haven't heard that, it basically chronicles our, me and Melanie's, about 12-year process of being heavily involved in a church, that church totally exploding and going away, and then us not going to church for about five years or so, and then the coming back to mm-hmm. uh, coming back to God. Of course, God never went anywhere. It was it was me. Um, but then you reached out, and that that the the story, the through line of that little series resonated with you. So just tell me a little bit about why what 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 led you to kind of reach out, and what what hit you in that series. Well, I think you all kind of mentioned it as you were going through the series about wanting to help other people. And I just think there's a lot of people that are dealing with similar stories. Now, everything's a little different because every church is a little different. Uh, The churches I've been involved in are smaller churches, smaller congregations, and um, not like the Mars Hill um, style exactly. But regardless of that, if you've been in some type of typical church setting or evangelical setting, you have a similar story. A lot of people are sharing this story and there's been a lot written about it, a lot of things on social media. Um, And so a couple of things resonated as you were talking through it because you were talking through it. So you were being real about what was going on with you and the fact that you're trying now to navigate the fact that you have children that have, I don't know to what extent they saw you going through different things of your spiritual journey. Uh, I was just listening recently and I I didn't realize the timeline of things. So the the episode Seth just did not long ago where he just talked um, and shared. um, And I think you said last November, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize it was that recent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so your own kids are, are kind of seeing this as well. And what I'm trying to do in my book is, there's a lot of, of things going on about deconstruction and breaking down faith and, and all of that, um, which I'll come back to in a second, because that was another thing in your series, mm-hmm. um, a comment that Melanie made during the series that, that stuck out to me. Uh, is go through those things where you break down certain concepts. But what I really wanted to do was then say, OK, we got to pass on something to the next generation. And what when we rebuild this, when we reconstruct this, what is the main thing? What is most important that we have and how can we do that? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what you were talking about resonated with me. And honestly, when I was reaching out, it was in a, in a way to um, take your feedback and, and, and how these things hit you as uh, people who are coaching other couples and, and your therapist background and, and all of that. But the other comment I wanted to make about the deconstruction is it seemed like, Melanie was um, kind of almost, I don't want to say turned off by that, that term, but Mm -hmm. that term has become almost like a fad term now. Mm -hmm. Like it's um, everybody's saying it and it, it can be triggering for some people and, Mm -hmm. and all of that. But I think deconstruction is just part of the natural process of going through your faith journey anyway. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're doing with breaking down language and concepts and then putting them back together we're calling it deconstruction now when in church settings, we were just calling it Bible study. I mean, it's really right. the same right. process that we're, we're going through. And so um, because I went through that for a while about not wanting to use that word um, just for the label that it carries with it. But I think it's OK to say that's what we're doing sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the way that you put that, because the way that I was seeing it again, the way I was seeing it used in culture was like, oh, well, I'm deconstructing, which means I don't need to follow any rules. I don't need to listen to, I don't, I don't really need to read my Bible. I can just kind of mm-hmm. throw out whatever I want, keep whatever I want, which is usually not very much, and still claim that I'm a Christian. And that just really rubbed me the wrong way because I feel like you, like, no, this is actually a part of your walk of faith. You, you like look at these things, you dissect them, you look at them, but you don't throw them out and you don't call it deconstruction and you don't just like give up on all of it because something was hard or weird or you didn't like how it felt. So that I, I love you. You're like, we just called it Bible study. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly like, that's the like sort of ethos that I wish was still there. This sort of like, like a tougher energy around it. Like we're learning together. That's mm-hmm. what we're doing. We're not just well, like abandoning <clears throat> so, ship. So, so, so. Part of it, and I'm not trying to be contrarian here, but I think even the like Bible study from so I grew up in the South and grew up in the church and stuff, and and Bible study was like I instantly have a picture in my mind of what that looks like, the type of people that are there, what kind of conversations we're having, and instantly I just say, gross, 
no, thank you. Like, I'm again, just being real. It's like, yuck, Bible study, no way. That's rude. Kind of thing. Well, no, I'm well, okay. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just the trying, Lord doesn't appreciate that. No, I'm saying that. So I, it's not like okay, no, I'm just talking about semantics or something like that. But but oh, so. I have a graduate degree, right, in marriage and family therapy, and the stuff that I learned in grad school was very Western approach, right? It was the 50-minute hour. The client comes to me in the office. We talk for 50 minutes. They pay a buttload of money because they have insurance, right? And then they go away. But what I learned in the real world, being in different communities, all kinds of communities, primarily uh, Indian country, like native native mm-hmm. stuff, and um, you know, and like we were talking about before, uh, in alternative schools and school settings, is like, oh, wait a minute, my approach to therapy and wellness is going to have to be drastically different if I want to be relevant to these kids, to these communities, and stuff like that. So I had to unlearn a lot of stuff that I learned in graduate school to be ac- applicable to the community I wanted to serve. Right, so. The, my deconstruction process is that's just what we'll call it, I guess, was the process of unlearning a bunch of stuff and then not being around the right people because everyone I knew was deconstructing and just a bunch right. of, you know, idiots, basically. Well, that's what I was <laughs> saying. Really. You, if you can't, mm-hmm. you can't deconstruct something and not have a someone who knows how to reconstruct it. Right. That's kind right. of, I think, the the takeaway there is that, mm-hmm. yeah, if you're deconstructing in a group of other people who are deconstructing and don't know how to reconstruct, what are you going to have as a foundation right. when you move forward? Probably not it, much. Then it was just an echo chamber, right? right? So I love the idea of a a kind of a, a, a new model, I don't know what you want to call it, of a Bible study. Like, I, I read, I've read the Bible every day this, this year, right? And that's kind of my goal. It's like, okay, read, read, read. And the idea of reading it with other guys or, or just groups of people is not the worst idea anymore to me. You know, God changed my heart on that, but it's it's more of a process of unlearning stuff. But I like your points mm-hmm. of sure, unlearn stuff, but maybe also sit in the company of other mm-hmm. people who have also walked through this process and we're not just an echo chamber of like, yeah, this sucks and church is this right. and that, because then that has gotten a lot of people in trouble for sure. Well and that reminds me of your book. Mm-hmm. Keep on. What were you gonna say? I interrupted you. Oh, no, no, there's a, there's a lot there. Um, I think one of the key parts is, you know, when you said that at first about the Bible study and Mm -hmm. you were like, Oh, gross. You know, I can, I can resonate with that for sure. I can relate to that. And I I think there is that aspect of it. I think one of the things that is missing so much in small groups, Bible study, not small groups necessarily, but some of these settings is we're doing way too much monologue when there needs to be dialogue. And when there's dialogue and there's a back and forth, then there's going to be um, kind of, I think a lot of people from a Jewish tradition are are more comfortable with the pushback and this back and forth. And, you know, the idea that you come around scripture and people debate it and that's healthy mm-hmm. and that's okay. Uh, I think that's missing a lot in a lot of church settings. It's more like somebody coming in as an authority and saying, this is what this means. This is what mm-hmm. you need to understand from this text. And if you disagree, so, you know, too bad, kind of mm-hmm. walk away with, with that teaching. Um, I think that that's one part of it. And you, you talk about unlearning. And I think that's the whole key is we have to figure out what do we have to unlearn? Because when you say unlearning, that's just another word for deconstructing in a sense, because you're going to have to take out some of the things you learn. And we have to make a decision about which of those things are essential to mm-hmm. to keep and and which of those things are okay to mm-hmm. let go of um and then the i'm sorry you were you were you were saying so so much good stuff and it was just kind of i said right. a lot i want to say one but, more hold well, on well, no, well, no, 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 no 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 ways. i have to say a thing because this is the thought i just had it's like saying it's like handing someone a multi-tool like you know those big old fat multi-tools what leatherman. do you got leatherman mm-hmm. i got seth a leatherman and so the bible and the scriptures and God's word has so, it's like a multi-tool. It's like a Leatherman. If you don't know how to use one of the tools, it doesn't mean you take the whole thing apart. Mm. That's kind of what I'm hearing is that we're saying we're deconstructing it. We're unlearning or whatever. Or you sit there holding the whole tool and go, someone else needs to help me know how to use this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this thing does, but that doesn't mean the whole thing is fake or false or bad or whatever. I don't know. I wanted to say that, but now you say what you were going to say. 
Well, no, that's a really good point. I think the last thing I was going to say is just uh, like Seth was saying, reading the Bible every day. And my my take on that, and I don't know if we're going to go back and forth on this or not, but is why. And so I think it's it's something we have to be careful of is defining that as the Christian faith is that we're doing certain things. Um, and I love the Bible. Do not hear me saying that. I you know, want to be in the Bible as much as I possibly can. But I think there's there's this thing we do where it, we just tell people, okay, make sure you're reading the Bible every day or make sure you're doing these things. And the objective, I feel like, is conforming to the image of Christ, like figuring out how to become more and more uh, like him. And Bible reading, for example, or Bible study needs to serve that purpose. And when it's not yeah. serving that purpose, then we need to reevaluate what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm sure that is the purpose for you. So I'm not judging that at all or anything. I just no, that's a <clears throat> that's a great that question. It's, totally good. Yeah. It's even got me thinking. And it's okay, Seth, why why are you reading the Bible? Um, number one, it's familiar, and mm -hmm. it is there's comfort in that, like reading things that I've read before. And then every time I read, and usually this is almost with all books that I read mostly, I read the same passage, same chapter, same whatever paragraph and I pick up something new from mm -hmm. it right because I try to be a, not try I am a growth mindset person that is constantly growing so when I read you know this one passage I was a different person you know oh you know a month later six months later a year later I'm a different person read it again with different mm -hmm. eyes and a different heart then I can glean a different wisdom from that and um <laughs> I've been reading kings of all things and uh First Kings and now in Second Kings, and I, I had to stop this morning because it's just like, oh my goodness, like all, all these people, and it turns into a long chronicle stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna read something a, a different chapter. But when when I was reading Kings, I got a lot from it, and it's a, a wacky story. It's like you know this one guy, you, some some youth were making fun of this one guy on a road, and he called out bears from the woods, and the kids got mauled. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, how does what what is that? Right? I mean, it's still it's still you know. <laughs> good to read, but I'm like, what? what is that? So back to the reason why is because I believe there's a lot of truth, there's wisdom, there's discernment, and a lot of tools to live by in, in the Bible. And mm -hmm. I want to, I want to be wiser. I want to have more discernment. I want to have more patience, love, kindness, all this stuff. And when I engross myself in a book that talks about that and then points back to Jesus, mm -hmm that's going to help me become a better husband, a person, father, worker, all this stuff. So, mm. uh, well, I like what you said earlier. And the, really the goal of reading the Bible, whether it's once a year or once every day, is to be more like Christ at the end of it. And I think of even the name Christians, I've heard some, I can't remember where I heard it, but it's like, you're a little, you're mirroring Christ, like you're a little Christ. That's the mm -hmm. point. Not that you are Christ, but you're trying to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. So I made up a word while we were talking. It was... Um, Christ, Christlets. What was it? Christian, what? Christ. It was funny. And I'll try to remember. It was really funny. Know. And now I forgot it, but it was like a little Christ. <laughs> like a, it's cracking I, me up. I think anyway. I think that's no, what the word ahead. actually means is little Christ. Like, yeah, that's what I thought. Like, yeah, yeah. And then when I said it, it sounded really Christians. weird. And I was like, someone's going to get mad at me. <laughs> Christlets. That's what it was. A little Christlet. <laughs> like a little tiny one. Anyway, like speaking chiclet. of reading. Yeah. Like a chiclet. <laughs> A little piece of gum. <laughs> a little piece of gum. Anyway, speaking of reading, tell us more about your book because we could clearly debate fun things all day. But tell us about your book and tell us why you wrote it and all of the things. Tell us the title. Give us the rundown. Yeah. Um, so the book is called You Don't Have to Do That. Um, and when I reached out to you, I was specifically talking about chapter eight of the book. But the way the book is set up is chapters one through six, uh, for lack of a better word, do go through the deconstruction process. And they... They take these big components of what we've been taught uh, regarding church, regarding the Bible, regarding church leadership, clergy, pastors, tithing and money, um, those kinds of things. And each chapter takes one of those topics. And that's really where the you don't have to do that part of it comes in. And then chapter seven is really, I think, the most important chapter of the book because it's the uh, who is Jesus to you? It's the it's the mm -hmm. turning point, the most important question. 
part of the book. And there's work to be done in chapter seven because you have to spend time figuring out who Jesus is to you based off of scripture and based off of your personal journey and experience. And then now that you've really done that and you're in that position to rebuild and move forward, because a lot of that work really is wilderness work. It's really, um, as you all talked about in your your series, um, that's tough when you're going through that that journey. And really, sometimes all you have to hold on to is Jesus. Like mm-hmm. a lot of what church is and what community is and faith really starts becoming mysterious almost, like trying to make sense of that. So going through that work, and as you go through that work, you move to chapters eight and nine of the book, which is really about moving forward. Chapter eight is all about, okay, so what are we going to do with our kids? What are we going Mm -hmm. to do with the next generation? Um, As this is unfolding for us, and we're on this journey, and then uh, chapter nine is is also looking forward, uh, future future focused. Um, So the idea with the book, and I will say this, there's a lot of voices out there right now. There's a lot of books that have been written about different aspects of that. What I tried to do to be somewhat unique in, in making a contribution is the reason that whole first part of the book is there is because I think, um, I'll, I'll use the word residue because that's what it feels like. It's like there's this residue, religious residue on me um, mm-hmm. as I'm trying to move forward with Jesus and it keeps pulling me back saying, no, but you have to do these things. You have to Mm -hmm. do them a certain way. You have to do church a certain way. These things, Bible study, even these things have to look a certain way if you're going to grow spiritually. And I'm trying to make the argument in the first part of the book. No, you don't. You don't have to do that actually. And it's okay to be free from that. There's no reason to have guilt and shame moving forward because with, once you have that freedom then the chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine stuff makes sense. And you're able to get some momentum moving, moving forward with your, with your Mm -hmm. kids. But then that, that last part of the book is missing from a lot of what's going on in society right now, because a lot of people are just bashing the church and just tearing it down. And I try to be very critical of the systems while also honoring the individuals within them, because I was one of them. I was Mm -hmm. completely sincere in everything I was doing when I was in the church, but there's a lot of stuff I look back on and it makes me shudder, you know, that I was teaching certain things or doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted that part where there is hope moving forward. There is hope. There is faith. Jesus is still a Jesus was was never having a problem with any of this stuff. He's, he's, he's secure in his identity. Like he, he knows who he is. And so it's just a matter of us responding to that and relating to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What well, one thing when when you said you look back on your pastoral experience and you just kind of shudder, you know, often, often, and I mean a couple of dozen times since November of 2022, I've just been in prayer, like on my walk slash runs and stuff like that, and asking forgiveness for like things that I said on this show for like three years. You know, you were worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to ask forgiveness for that? Like, you know, it, it, it's so it's so funky, but if I, if you or I go, oh my goodness, I can't believe I said those things. Oh Lord, yeah. please forgive me. This is, I mean, God doesn't want us to dwell on that. It's like, mm-hmm. yo, I've forgotten it. You've gone through the process of forgiveness and, you know, it, turn, you're, you're, you're different now, mm-hmm. but it, that, that does, it has come up often. Like, I cannot believe that I would say that. And I listened to, I mean, for crying out loud, I listened to like worship music on my runs and stuff, you know, and I would make fun of people who did that earlier. And there's this one song, it's a Marissa Joe Day song. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think on an episode I have it playing, uh, but just some of the lyrics, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was me. Like I mocked and I made fun and all this stuff. And it, it was really sobering of like, oh my goodness, wait a minute. But like you said, God didn't go anywhere. It was me. And then I was the one that got called back, like the prodigal son story. And that is so powerful. And having grown up in the church and then experiencing it this way is completely different. So that that mm-hmm. residue, as you were talking about, like, oh, it's got to look like this. And I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I don't know if you know much about Pentecostal Church of God or if that was what you were 
uh, grew up running in. Running down like, the aisles. Running the aisles, speed. speaking in tongues and all, you know, hallelujah. Fainting in the choir. Time and just all kinds <laughs> of stuff, which, okay, that that's fine, right? right? I'm not, but it also can look a different way, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that that residue. I think a lot of us have that residue and go, oh, what what is this? But I do want to go back to when we were talking about deconstruction, it was like, so we do home projects and stuff. I built the walls and doors in the studio and stuff. And it was like we were taking apart a wall, right? So we find where the screws are in the sheetrock, okay? We unscrew those screws. We take the sheetrock off. We take the tape off. We find the insulation. We take the insulation out. Now we take the studs down and everything. So, we, so we're learning how a wall is built in that process. Like, oh, okay, when I put this back up, I'm going to put new insulation. I'll put new two by fours or whatever, or two by sixes, and then put the wall up this way or put paneling this time. And my deconstruction process, along with a bunch of podcasts that I've listened to and a bunch of friends that I used to hang out with, is like, we took the entire wall down, but we never put anything back up. Right. You put like a tarp. No, we didn't put anything (laughs) and just said, can we believe how stupid that wall was that was there and judge it and, you know, and so it's important to... You have to put it back together. I mean, you don't mm-hmm. have to, I guess, if you don't want to. But it's been very important for me to to put it back together and unlearn a bunch of un- unlearn a bunch of stuff. Yeah, you brought up something interesting. Is and I think I probably mentioned this in the redemption series. And then I'm gonna. It reminds me of something funny that happened when I went to read your book. So when we, so your experience of faith, like you said, you grew up Pentecostal, all of that stuff. I did not have that. Holy so Ghost my <laughs> my experience of becoming a Christian was that huge fundamental shift. I mean, I lost all of my friends. It was completely transformative for me. Came out of the blue, made no sense, didn't line up with any of the values that I was living before. And so it felt so much more precious to me, like something I couldn't lose. Mm. So when all of my friends are saying, well, I'm deconstructing, they were all people who grew up in the church. They were all people who mm. like kind of could take it for granted because they didn't need it, if that makes sense. And I, I know that's a hard word to say, didn't need it, because I needed it. Like, I, it was like the only, I said this in therapy last mm-hmm. week, the only people I had supporting me for a long time was me and Jesus and Joyce Meyer. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. just her books, not her personally, but I wish. Um, and so it's interesting because that... Joyce on speed down. I wish. Uh, so that, that was like a cool insight, as you were saying that, that my faith felt I wanted to protect it more because I fought for it. I lost things for it. I paid a price to have my faith mm-hmm. that I don't know that you paid. So it's just interesting. No. That's interesting. But then I want to tell you I paid a price for thing. deconstructing. That's right. And so did I, because <clears throat> you were so terrible. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not fake. But anyway, <laughs> when I went to go read your chapter, I went to read chapter eight. This was the weirdest thing you sent. And it felt like such a cool thing. And I was like, oh, I have to remember to tell him this. You're like, it starts on page, I think it was like 183 or something. Not 183, whatever page it was. I could not find the page. I know. Yeah. I was like, it's not that long. So I couldn't find the page. Like I literally was like, I would look at my email, go to the PDF, go back. And I couldn't find it. And so I ended up going backwards and backwards and trying to find the chapter beginning. And I read all of chapter seven and then eight showed up. Like it was the weirdest thing. And it felt like it happened on purpose because chapter Mm. seven is great. It is really, really, really good. Um, The like, what is Jesus to you one? And I was like, this yeah. feels cool. This feels like God made me read more than I was going to read. And it just felt really cool. And I liked it. Um, but I want to say too, your writing style is really engaging and fun. Like I love, I love books. I love reading. And the way you write is fun. And it feels like this really great mixture of being serious, but not overly serious, clear and fun and engaging. So I don't know. I just wanted to kind of give you like kudos for how you write. But I do want to say you have to make it an audiobook or I will never finish it because I can't read anything. It's too hard for me. Are you going to do that, sir? Uh, I, I don't know. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> there's no immediate plans to do that, but I would, I would love to do that. Uh, but I, I appreciate to. that. Thank you for saying that about the, the writing. And um, I'm glad to hear that about chapter seven, too, because I, chapter seven, I think, is the hardest chapter, uh, like I said, because it actually requires more work on the part of the reader uh, mm-hmm. because you really have to start making some decisions about what do I believe about Jesus and, mm-hmm. and, and wrestling with those things. Um, but I also think chapter seven is, is great because in the sense that I, 
as you know, I just go straight to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I just pull the things straight from the scripture and they are beautiful what they say about Jesus. And we're spending so much time emphasizing other things when what it's saying about Jesus should be the things that we're emphasizing. Mm -hmm. And once you have that foundation, then you go into chapter eight. So I'm glad it worked out that way for you. Um, maybe I put the wrong page number on purpose and I didn't know it. You I did. Know. I went in and rechecked later and I was like, that was so weird. I've never had that happen. It should have worked. And it, it like made me read the chapter. It was great. Mm -hmm. I loved it though. Were That's you good. Say something? It's a, a, a nice coincidence, yes. right? Or maybe not. <laughs> but let, let's talk about how this impacts our kids. I know that you have devoted some time to that. And, and one thing that I did feel I guess convicted, it was a real thought in my mind when we basically just stopped going to church mm -hmm. altogether. I was thinking, man, how is this going to impact our kids and, and what, what are we going to do mm -hmm. around this? And I mean, it, it became so normal that we didn't go to church. We didn't even think about it. You know, Sunday was just like Saturday, literally exactly like Saturday, even Easter Sundays which growing up in the South, that is the Super Bowl. That is the biggest day ever. And it was just another day. Not this last one. We went to church this last one. But it was just another day. And and, and eventually, I, I got used to the fact that we just completely weren't taking our kids to church. Well, I would still pray with them and lead them in prayer and stuff like that. But church was not a thing. And I just felt guilty, felt weird about it at the onset. But what what is your take on that what what do you have to say about that and how can we help families deal with that because i've talked to a bunch of people mm -hmm. about that same thing as well so let me start by kind of throwing it back to you a little bit and just asking where do you feel like that came from first of all i totally relate to it on um, so i should say this our journey um talking about our family specifically my wife and me uh, since we were involved, I mean, you, you all were involved in, in worship and, and different leadership as well. But when you're in that role and, and to complicate things, the pastor of my church was my father-in-law. So mm. um, there was a family, literal family rift, if you will. Um, that might be too strong of a word, but it definitely shakes the, the extended family when you walk away from the formal ministry part of it. And so I was really learning all of these things about what you might call simple church, organic church, just the idea of following Jesus and with a community of people and, and away from the church structures. But man, that guilt, uh, it just kept, it just kept, that's why I call it the residue. It just, it just stays on you and it's not God saying that you're doing something wrong, but it's mm -hmm. just that you've been in that habit and that tradition for so long. And plus you have loved ones that are really stressing that you should be doing that as well. And also uh, for my wife in particular, um, I would say also for me, but I moved right into the school uh, work. Mm -hmm. Like I, I went right into teaching middle school. And so I immediately had a new community uh, pretty quickly of colleagues and coworkers and friends. Um, my wife didn't make that transition like, like that. And so the social aspect of church losing that was a, was a really heavy loss uh, for her. And so I think all of that ties in with the guilt that we feel uh, going along. So I, I will say I resonate with it and I'm kind of speaking out of both sides of my mouth when I push this back to you now to, to mm -hmm. say, where do you feel like the guilt came from? for you? Um, I, let's see. I don't know if it came from, from, well, it wasn't, it wasn't God like, Hey, what are you doing as a dad? You know, it was more of just comparing how I grew up like in, in church on Sundays, you know, sometimes Sunday night, even, you know, there's a night service and churches in the South do that. And then of course, church on Wednesday and just remembering uh, the the community, kind of the social aspect of it, the the cultural aspect of it, and I I was saddened because I was like, my kids aren't getting this. They're just they're just not mm -hmm. getting it. And 
I didn't replace it with anything. You know, we might go to the woods or, you know, do other stuff, you know, during church time or, or whatnot. Like, hey, let's go do something as a family, which is fine. Um, but I, I, it, I, felt, I felt sad in a way. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my kids aren't having that same experience and not like I'm trying to perpetuate, oh, okay, when they're, when they're older, they're going to have to unlearn crap, you know, from, from the church. It wasn't that. It was like just the little lessons and the Sunday school songs and, you know, the big church songs and stuff like that. It's like, that's a whole vibe. It's a, it's a mm-hmm. culture around it. And, and a lot of that is, is meaningful, you know, you know, like, oh yeah, crazy aunt Sally is always up in the front, you know, hooting and hollering and, and this, and then, oh, there's a dinner in the gym after the church mm-hmm. where, you know, aunt Betty brings a casserole and it's the best thing ever, you know, just like small stuff like that. And that's more of the cultural aspect. And I was seeing that my kids just weren't getting that. And then I felt convicted, I guess, as, as a, as a dad, as a leader, and I had to ask myself, hey, what am I doing? What, what, am, I, what am I setting my kids up for? Right. right? Which it, is challenging because that culture isn't out, even out here. Like yeah. the culture of what he's talking about doesn't really happen where we live. Mm-hmm. Uh, there aren't like Wednesday church things. There aren't old ladies bringing casseroles. And so, I don't know, there's a lot to be said even for that. That yeah. like we could, we sensed attention. We knew we were like, this is, we're, de- we're depriving our kids of a thing that is good mm-hmm. is the best way that I think we could think to say it. But then also mm-hmm. kind of at the same time, but we don't see it anywhere, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so really wrestling with that and then, and then kind of knowing, and that's a lot of pressure too. It's like, okay, well, if, if I want my kids to experience this, then I have to kind of create that mm-hmm. myself. And, and that's just a lot on me because you, you, didn't grow up with, you know, Aunt Betty's casserole or, or well, we, whatnot. Well, we grew up in the Catholic Church, so mm-hmm. it was really different, but similar energies where you're serving you're serving people. Like, what well, we would serve, like, the elderly people after church. We would, yeah. like, bake them things. Mm-hmm. and well, yeah, which, It was way more boring because it was Catholic. But it, it's, it's, it's good, though, because your <laughs> yeah, kids but it's are good. learning you're service. You're learning and, to, like, mm-hmm. clean the sanctuary. and It's weird, but it works, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, but why did you ask that question? Cause you threw it back to us and I would love to know what you were thinking. Well, I, I think, so one of the things I talk about in the book is making sure that there's a distinction made between church as an organism and church as an organization. And mm-hmm. A lot of what we feel like we have to do relates to the organization of the church. That there's a Mm -hmm. church structure, that there's a church service, that the things you were just talking about Sunday night, Wednesday night, that it has to look a certain way. Uh, Somebody gets up and they preach a sermon and those things happen. And there's nothing wrong, evil, bad about those things. But we do need to understand that those are the organization at work where what Jesus does in the New Testament is describes the church as an organism. It's a it's a living thing. He talks about seeds. He talks about a vine and branches, talks about trees, talks about the human body. And it's important to understand that because with all of those living organism analogies, he's always the source of life. He's mm-hmm. always the one providing the nutrients and everything that is needed is in is within the seed at the beginning. It's within the community of the people together, and that can that can be a, a family in a home. That can be uh, you and a friend in a car talking together. It can be this conversation right here. Those kinds of things is the church at work in the sense of it being an organism where Jesus and His Spirit are leading the way, and. It's not just a matter of semantics. And, and the reason I kind of push, put it back to you and then just so we can sit with that for a minute is because there are going to be a lot of pressures on us from the organization. And if we're not mm. feeding into the organization, then we're doing something wrong is, is, that, mm. is that sense. And I think even your, your comment about, you know, you said we could go into the woods and, and, and do that with our family. I wouldn't minimize that. Like I wouldn't downplay the fact that you're with your family in nature and they're getting to relate to you as dad. And there's all these interactions going on. They're learning 
about your faith journey. You're they're learning about God in those moments, but we don't call it that. We're, we're we don't label it that because the organization says that's separate from spiritual growth, and it and it's mm-hmm. just not, in my opinion. Oh yeah, I 100% agree with that. Like when you take into perspective, and and I'm very much an outdoors person. I always have been. When you take into perspective of God created all this and the system of 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 regeneration and how the trees grow and then you know death and life and everything it's just like a perfect it, it's all it all works perfectly right and though so when you take a kid out you know and it's just I talk like hey look at this tree look at this giant thing or whoa did you see that animal it's like yeah God created all of it and it's it's really good in nature kind of mm-hmm. thing but I I think the what what I was I guess referring to was church wasn't even a thought. You know, we would still go to the woods yeah. and stuff like that, but then really getting back into that and man, growing up in 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 southern church, it's like you felt guilty from the organization mm. if you missed a Sunday, you know? Oh, where are you at, brother Seth or you know, whatever kind of thing and you felt like, "Oh, man, okay. I you know, oh, I'm sorry I was sick, but you know, actually I was out drinking Saturday night and had a hang, you know, like and that's that's how it looked a lot." Uh, um but I don't feel any of that residue anymore. It's just a completely different uh, feel, and I, I just, I just wanted my kids to experience that because that was a, a mm-hmm. an important part of my life. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I just wanted to clarify. I wasn't mocking you when you said that. You used that tone when you're like just in the woods, and so I was doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> that was no, funny. Absolutely. Well, and I want to say one more thing too about like you said. Um, Again, I feel like I'm nitpicking your words for some reason, but you were like, oh, you know, like the small things, like Aunt Sally's always in the front doing whatever. Those are actually not small things. Those are interactions with believers. And it kind Mm -hmm. of gave me this insight too, as because I didn't grow up having a church like this, that I thought of, I don't think of church as like one building. I think of it as Christians, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Christlets. (laughs) I think of it as all the little tiny Christians, not tiny, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The people that make up the body of Christ And so it's interesting to have that insight as we're chatting that I just love church because I love Christians because I love Christ. And so that was, it was really hard for me. Again, I was like, our church fell apart. I wouldn't stop going if it stayed together and our pastor left. That would have been a whole, we would have been there still, but it literally fell apart. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting thought. And, And it's, I think what I find challenging is that most, again, I think people who were raised in the church who are then deconstructing tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater, baby Jesus. They throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater because it wasn't something they kind of fought for and scrapped for and had to like lose friendships over or whatever. But I didn't want to do that. And I I wanted to keep it close to me. And I I just, it's cool to like, take it for granted. No. And I always listened to like Joyce Meyer and different teachers um, the whole time that we weren't in church still. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just like a cool insight that I'm experiencing, like as we're talking about it. But then also, um, I do want to go back around to like, you give hope to people. Like you're saying, you know, you got it. You do have to grapple with this stuff, but then you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. It's not just a, well, wash my hands of this. Hope my kids figure it out. Sorry, I'll pay for your therapy. Like it's not that. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. our culture that has this, this like cancel culture, everyone is so ready to drop everything so fast. And I think that's Mm -hmm. damaging. I think it's unhealthy. And I think some of us can like feel it in our spirit around our faith. And so I just love, love, love that at the end of all of it, at the end of your book, the whole goal is to say, okay, yeah, it was hard. Yes, let's talk about it. But now here's how we move forward. Here's how we intentionally move forward in our faith, with our kids, in our future. Because I think that is deeply lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, There are so many people just like toss it all out. It was all bad white people are the worst. Jesus is just this, like, it's all Mm -hmm. terrible. Like everyone's doing that all the time. And we just can't, we just can't be that, um, whatever it is, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No. And recognizing that God is for you, but Mm -hmm. God wants you to come through that journey and, and wants to be with you. I mean, that's the whole point of the gospel is that Jesus came to be among us Mm -hmm. and he's full of grace and truth. And, wants us to remain in him and wants us to be in relationship and mm-hmm. um, that that's the desire of God and, and God's heart. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I have Can a question I, for oh. you. Uh, oh, well, what, what do you want 
the readers of your book to take away? And maybe that's a huge question, you know, because there's chapters and each one has its own thing. But just like the, the crux of the, the book, I wrote this book because and I want my readers to walk away with XYZ. What is that for you? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, and we just talked about uh, one of them, just recognizing that this is what God wants. God, God is for you. God is closer than you think um, in many situations. Uh, the part that I think relates a lot with children and a, a big takeaway that I want people to, to have from the book is in chapter eight, I talk about this idea that um, we're preparing children to be responsible. And that, because I hear that a lot about responsible Christianity and you got to do the responsible thing. And so I look at responsible as response able the ability to respond to life, the ability to respond to situations. And what a lot of religion does, and, and I'm talking about Christian religion, what, what it does is it prepares us, it prepares our children to respond to God's laws or God's rules or the do's and don'ts of, of Christianity. Jesus equips children, equips us to respond to God's love. And so everything is about that distinction and understanding that difference. And that's, that's one of the major takeaways. Another major takeaway is that, okay, so what does that mean practically? Mm -hmm. And what that practically means is you go back to the fruit of the spirit over and over because Jesus said, so he said, people, people will know you are my followers. You're mm -hmm. my disciples that you're with me by your love, by your fruit. And that fruit is, joy and peace and patience and it's the way we interact with each other and treat each other and you'll notice there's not one religious practice in that list mm. of of that makes up the fruit and so recognizing that that fruit is the evidence of the spirit at work and so whether you are with your family in the woods or whether you are in a church service and crazy aunt who did you call her is it sally. Sally? I don't know, sally or betty <laughs> it's in the front it's it still comes back to the spirit of god is at work in in all of these different things and then i think the last thing i would say is just that whole question of who is jesus to you if nothing else like if people listen to this this conversation right here never read my book who is jesus to you is the most important question and it's it's more important than where do you go to church what do you believe about this issue or that issue it's who is jesus to you and getting with people who you can talk through that with have that conversation uh, the bible in the new testament the people the followers of jesus were obsessed with jesus in the new testament and that comes out in scripture and wrestling with that question and, and recognizing, sorry, this is the last thing, recognizing that that answer is, all you need to worry about is that answer for this moment. Mm. And next month, your answer might be different because you're in a different set of circumstances and Jesus is responding to you differently. Mm. And so what I hope people leave with is not only that sense, but you as parents, me as a parent, recognizing that our own children are going to answer that question differently at different times. And that's okay. That's okay. My younger daughter right now, uh, she probably would not be thrilled with me saying this, but my younger daughter right now in that answer to that question of who is Jesus to you, because we had this conversation just recently, she's, she's really struggling with the fact that she can't see God, you know? So everything is, she said, you know, faith, spirit. Um, and then we talked about just prayer and how prayer sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense. And she says, you know, sometimes it feels like you're just saying the words. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know that somebody's responding to those words. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of people and this, me, 15 years ago, I would have said, oh no, oh no, what are we going to do about this? You know, what's going on with her faith? Is, you, but now I, I appreciate that. I respect that because it's honest. It's real. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it's what most of us are wondering and struggling with ourselves. We just don't say it. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think how she answers that question today might be different next month, might be different from the month after that. And I have to trust, don't, don't get me wrong, it's not hands off. I have to do my mm-hmm. part too, but I have to trust that God is wanting the same things I just said for mm-hmm. her as for everybody else, wants to be close to mm-hmm. her. And, and my prayer from early on, from the, uh, you know, when my wife was pregnant with our first daughter, it just became real to me so quickly that, oh God, I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, I need your help. I need you to be the leader. So my prayer every day is protect and provide for them mm-hmm. in ways that only you can. Because I mm-hmm. want to do that as a dad. I want to protect and provide. That's something that's in us, I think, to do as husbands and as mm-hmm. fathers. But also acknowledging I'm never, ever going to do it like God can. And he's going to do it perfectly. And so I want my daughters as, you know, my daughter's turning 21. She's off to college right now. She's going to have to really tie into her heavenly father because dad here can't do that for her. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's, yes, I think all that is is beautiful. I pray every day for the kids, like spiritual protection, physical protection. When, you know, I mean, they're at school. I'm mm-hmm. not there. You know, when when they're here, I can protect right. them right. physically and stuff like that. But they're away. And that's the mm-hmm. natural uh, progression and maturation of just all of us, right? We we grow up. And one, what was I going to say? Um, if you don't remember, I want to no, say No, I do remember. And it... Uh, I go back to how I was raised in the church, you know, and I'm thinking of that that verse in Proverbs, you know, train up a child uh, in the way they should go, right? And me coming back to God, of course it was God, it just wasn't me, but I really leaned heavily on a lot of those lessons and those things that I learned and picked up as a kid in Sunday school and, you know, in youth group and stuff like that. And I want to give my children that same thing just all the lessons you know all the lessons all the the uh well yes just everything about it and um uh and i think that's my job Mm -hmm. you know it's my job to lead it it's our job to do it together and um so they will have those things and those teachings just like your daughter is like okay you know i've trained them up and now you you let them you let them go Mm -hmm. um in, in a in a good way. So what were you going to say? Well, I want to say a thing, but I don't because we got to just say, we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. And I want people to go get your book and go to the places that they can find you and where you want them to go. So let's do that instead of the thing I was going to say. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so tell us where people can find your book and all of that jazz. Yeah, so you can find the book anywhere. Again, it's called You Don't Have to Do That. Um, and it's on Amazon. It's it's You can find it anywhere. I, I will, I don't know if this helps or not, I, I will send you the link to my author page on the publishing site because you can get it a little cheaper there uh, nice. as well. And so if you want to um, make that available to people. Um, I'm trying to uh, get going with some social media stuff, but um, I'm definitely in the um, infancy uh, stages of that. So um, I think the book is, is the main thing. Um, and um yeah, I think that's I think that's the main thing I was going to say as, as far as yeah. uh, what you can do. You can find me on Twitter at, at Mark J. Scott. But, uh, Mark with a C. Mark with a C, yes. yes right. That's right. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much, you know, for, for reaching out, for sending us the book. Um, I hope people go and get it. You guys go and make sure. There's a lot of valuable lessons. Obviously, your heart is is in it as an educator and, you know, being formally in the church and then having kids, it's like, obviously you have thought Mm -hmm. a lot about this stuff. And I think it's really good sound advice. So I appreciate your time, man. Um, You guys go get the book for sure. And uh, yeah, this has been a fun conversation. Yeah. Thank thank you so much. And um, can I, I know we got to wrap it up, but I just want to say thank you to you two. Uh, And and seriously, thank you for being real. Um, When I first, you know, tuned into your podcast uh, a few years ago, that's what, that's what hooked me. Uh, is that you were just real and genuine. And um, so thank you for being willing, willing to do that. And um, I appreciate all the resources you put out there. My wife and I are trying to, uh, not trying, we're getting started with the the power, the cu- power yeah. couple planner. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And, uh, Look, I'll show you mine. It's right here. Yeah. Keep uh, on, keep on. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and we're just in the first part of it. And we're talking about our, 
marriage mission and vision. And we're kind of camped out right there now because we're having, it's leading to some, some conversations. So we haven't even gotten into the, like the calendar part of the book yet, but uh, awesome. I appreciate That's everything awesome. you're doing. Yeah, thank man. You. Thanks thank, for this thank opportunity you so much. to talk through this. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. thank you for hanging in there on the, the years for the years because oh, there were yeah, some years for, for the, for uh, the, but i, I want to thank you for bringing hope like re, even reaching out it's just it means a ton to us like genuinely means a lot and bringing hope to families is huge so thank you for the work that you do so everybody go get his book get the book and thank you so much for hanging out with us all right all thanks right, man we'll talk to you later day. all right bye bye thanks for listening to anatomy of us this podcast is produced by my mom, Melanie Studley, and hosted by my dad, Seth Studley. Our show is edited and published by our producer, Reva Hansen, from Creative Media Support. Special thanks to our Patreon members that get an extra episode every week. Thanks for watching. Love you. Bye. Bye.